astonishing was that his cognitive powers were normal, his mental powers were normal, but his personality had utterly changed. He was a very fun-loving, uh, uh, gregarious guy with lots of friends beforehand, and afterwards, everyone said he was just a mean SOB. Right. Uh, people couldn't stand him. And they said, what happened to the gauge we used to know? And, we're, 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 and, and basically, he lost all his friends, and tragically, what, what he wound up doing is he wound up being a carnival sideshow act where he would take the tamping iron and reinsert it in the healed hole through his head for people to see, and they would pay some money to see this in a, mm-hmm. in a circus sideshow. Uh, but what, was, what it points out, I think from a neurological perspective, is that this region, our frontal cortex, is the seat of our individuality. If you mess with that then your, it's not just your cognition has ch- been changed, your very personality has changed. And of course, this region is the area I was talking about that is most recently evolved, the area that has expanded enormously in the, in the human lineage. And uh, lobotomies and leukectomies. Lobotomies, I think most everybody has heard of, and um, I think they, they, people would be interested in on. Um, whereabouts in the brain um, the lobotomy is directed? Uh, oof, yeah, lobotomies were, 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 were a terrible thing. And uh, uh, they were, they, they came in vogue, I believe, starting in the 1940s. And they continued to about the end of the 1960s. And they were proposed as a cure for mostly for people with schizophrenia, although also with mania in some cases. And basically what you did is you went in through through the eye socket, you'd make a hole in that portion of the skull, and you'd put in a stiff metal wire and basically scramble up the brain tissue in the frontal lobe. And this would often leave people very docile and it, they became, you know, kind of zombie-like and very easy to manage in long-term psychiatric hospitals. But they weren't cured at all. They were, they were. It, it was just utterly inhumane and disastrous. Now, and you know, everyone. And it's fascinating to see, I mean, because I worked uh, quite a few um, psychiatric units before I went to graduate school, mm-hmm. and it, it was uh, it was really something to interact with folks who had had lobotomies. Oh, oh, it's it's just it's 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 on beyond sad. You know what's amazing is that uh w- the developers of the lobotomy were awarded the Nobel Prize. <laughs> We always think of the Nobel Prize as being something, you know, that is utterly exalted and only goes to to things that really stand the test of time uh, uh, scientifically. I I, I bet the Nobel Committee would like to have that one back if they could. Now, um, help me on this one if you can, because I'm embarrassed I'm not remembering. Uh, A leukectomy is just a, a more sophisticated lobotomy. Uh, a, luke- a leukectomy is, a, I believe, a lobotomy that is tr- designed to try to uh, interfere with the axons, which are the fibers of passage between nerve cells uh, uh, that run in the frontal cortex, and to leave the gray matter, which are the cell bodies of the neurons, uh, more or less intact. In general, in the brain, you have regions where cell bodies cluster and they're called gray matter, and then you have regions where the, the wires between neurons, these axons, pass, and they're called white matter. And so the leukectomy was designed to try to, to be more subtle and disrupt frontal white matter uh, yeah. and sparing more gray matter. And it was slightly less damaging, but it was no more effective. Uh, there's really no, there was no, there was no effectiveness at all uh, for for lobotomies or or leukectomies. Uh, the, it, it's a good thing that they're gone. Yeah, without any question. Unlike yeah. the uh, electroshock, electroconvulsive therapy, which has turned around a bit. Well, I would say, I mean, uh, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I, my understanding of literature is that for a subset of people with depression that is intractable uh, to drugs and talking therapy, that 
that a fraction of those people will benefit from uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, what's interesting is that now there is a, a form of therapy that you're probably familiar with called transcranial magnetic stimulation, yes. or TMS, which uh, and a lot of people are are turning to that uh, as a therapy for depression because it's it's somewhat uh, uh, less uh, medically violent right. than uh, than electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, and it may well be that it ultimately replaces it as a uh, as a cure for intractable depression. I think it would be interesting also for listeners to hear um, for you to uh, help us with some of the myth, myths that we have about our uniqueness as human beings or our human brains compared to um, whales and elephants and birds and even Neanderthals? Well, right. I mean, I think it's a very, it's a very interesting question because, you know, clearly humans are fundamentally, you know, we, we have cognitive modes that are different than, well, you know, it's a little hard to study whales. We don't know that much about them. But clearly than, say, uh, chimpanzees. Uh, for example. So our, our communicative abilities, while chimpanzees do have rudimentary forms of communication, they don't have language that's like human language. And while uh, chimpanzees can imagine what the thoughts of another chimpanzee can be like, what was called social cognition, uh, their ability to do that is much more rudimentary than humans. But what's what's interesting is if you look at the brain of a chimpanzee and you look at the brain of a human, it's not like you can put your finger and say, oh, aha, look, see, that structure in the human, that's the thing that's absolutely unique, that bump, that swelling, that molecule. None of those things have been found. The human brain looks, to a large degree, like a chimpanzee brain writ large. In other words, its volume is about threefold larger than a chimpanzee brain, mm -hmm. and the frontal cortex is a somewhat larger fraction of the total in a human than a chimpanzee. But there's nothing that leaps out at you and says, ah, see how this human brain is fundamentally different. And the same thing seems to be occurring so far. We now have the we know when now have the entire uh, we now have the chimpanzee genome, and we have the macaque monkey genome, and of course the human genome, and we can compare them. And so far, there's not an aha thing where you can say, oh, well, look, there's, here's this gene that's utterly unique uh, in humans uh, that is only expressed in the most recent parts of the brain and is a good candidate for giving rise to our uniquely human cognitive uh, structures. Uh, that hasn't come to be. Uh, right now, this is this is a bit of a mystery. What is it that makes our human brains unique compared to our nearest primate relatives? We don't really know. Uh, we know they're bigger, but how that is that that translates into having sophisticated language as opposed to rudimentary language, we don't understand that. I'm curious about uh, the um, elephant brain, and the reason is yeah. I've been I've seen a couple of uh, programs recently where elephants are just are showing a, an extraordinarily sophisticated uh, complex um, social structures um, hierarchy and uh, displays of emotion Perhaps well right tears well, right. So, ele I mean, elephants do uh, do live in extended social groups. They they they're acutely aware of who is related to whom and who is doing what. They have um, matriarchal uh, uh, social hierarchies, and uh, you know they have very sophisticated emotional lives, as do uh, chimpanzees and, uh, and, and gorillas for that matter. It's a little easier to see th some of this play out in those species that live in large social groups like, uh, elephants and, uh, and, and chimps and macaques than it is, uh, in animals that live, that live, uh, in a, uh, in much smaller groups than, say, like orangutans. Uh, 
but uh, you know, as I, as I said, the emotional parts of our brain are really are really not fundamentally different than that of the higher mammals.